It's 6 o'clock in London, it's 1pm in New York, 1am in Hong Kong, 3am in Sydney, 10am in San Francisco and 10.30 at night in Mumbai. <clears throat> Greetings, good morning, good afternoon and good evening depending on where you are in the world. My name is Patrick L. Young. The IPO Vid Livestream, Series 14, Episode 6, that's Episode number 84 in the total math, starts here. Good grief. Only last Monday and Tuesday morning, I sat in meetings with incredulous folk who couldn't believe the Exchange Invest thesis that FTX might not survive the week. With regulators in the Bahamas and Cyprus shutting the exchange down, frankly, the only argument looks to be right now, is Chapter 11 too high a number? And is it more a 7 or a 9 thing that we're looking forward to? Questions abound surrounding the what happens next, as it appears some of FTX management were culpable in the theft stroke disappearance of at least a billion dollars of customer funds. And throughout the week, I am absolutely ecstatic to note that the team at Exchange Invest was consistently ahead of the activity as FTX spiraled into collapse, having worried us throughout summer as they're spending $250 million here, $250 million there. And suddenly you're talking about real money, so-called rescue of the crypto infrastructure appeared rather curious at best. Of course, this week, it's an opportunity for the Harry Hindsights of this world to gather at the Futures Industry Association's annual Chicago Expo. You may recall we were at Boca all those months ago when we had a fantastic interview with Trabu Bland of the Intercontinental Exchange. Check that out wherever you're watching this. You can catch the whole thing recorded for posterity. But of course, one of the things overhanging the entirety of the FIA Boca Raton conference in Florida this year was the looming brooding presence of FTX. FTX having last December the 6th, how appropriate, Pearl Harbor Day, brought together what could have been the, actually the immolation of the U.S. Central Counterparty clearing system had anybody been listening to the FTX management. One person who actually was listening to the FTX management, and even less than a month ago, was still drinking the Kool-Aid of how wonderful some of Sam Bankman frieds possible prognostications, and indeed his CCP proposal could be, was none other than Chairman Rustin Benham of the CFTC, who's going to be giving the keynote at the FIA Expo 2022. Well, we've been working on a draft of Chairman Benham's remarks for this conference. Feel free to listen to this and give us some feedback or indeed possibly pass it to the CFTC with some annotations, because let's face it, if he'd been reading Exchange Invest, he wouldn't have made such a hash of his FTX relationship. So I think his keynote should go something like this. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry. I am very, very, very sorry. I'm very, 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 very sorry. I'm very, 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 very sorry indeed. We acknowledge that in my excitement to catch up with technology where the CFTC has been behind the curve for 25 years or more now, we tried to get ahead and doing so demonstrated our crass lack of understanding of some fundamentals. It's back to basics for me and the CFTC. And once again, I'm very sorry for entertaining what could have been a very dangerous proposal to the CFTC and the firmament of the financial market structure, Contagion Risk et al., which was presented without any underlying coherent data to support the thesis by somebody who is likely to be subject to proceedings from our and other agencies going forward. As I believe Chairman Benham should conclude his result or his remarks, I support judicious use of technology and innovation, but appreciate I may have been precipitate in expressing excitement about FTX's CCP proposals. Once again, I'm very, very sorry. Something along those lines, I think, should be a good start to clear the air, as certainly there are a lot of people baying for the blood of the CFTC chairman after the course of the last year. On a happier note, ladies and gentlemen, congratulations to international metal platform AGE, IMP. They've announced they're launching a spot trading platform for ferro alloys, noble alloys and minor metals from the 5th of December. Most exciting still, hearty congratulations to our tech 
Iraqi friends at Sanara. Our IPO vid guest 061 was, of course, Hamish Adurian, the man in charge of marketing and promotion for the great Sanara technology brand. Delighted to see that Sanara's technology will be launching this new IMP web-based platform. Great news. And we look forward to further developments in due course. Well done, Sanara. Our guest today, ladies and gentlemen, is Alessandro Hatami. Alessandro Hatami has been, well, reinventing banking for quite a long time during his career. He's the founder and managing partner of advisory firm Pacemakers.io, specializing in driving digital transformation in banking organizations. Alessandro has more than 15 years experience, including as COO of Digital Banking and Group Innovation Director at Lloyds Banking Group, Director of Large Merchant Services at PayPal UK and MD of Paypoint.net. Alessandro is deeply embedded in the European fintech firmament, and he actually happens to be a non-executive director of Cash Plus Bank while mentoring and investing in fintech startups across the continent. Alessandro, welcome to IPO Vid. Where in the world are you today? Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. I'm in uh, semi-sunny London, actually. Uh, so enjoying the British weather, um, slightly unseasonally warm, I have to say, but uh, quite nice. Yes, it's quite remarkable, actually, because I mean, just due to weird logistics, I'm coming from the other side of London, although admittedly it's not quite so sunny in this part, but certainly the weather has been unseasonably reasonable so far by London standards <clears throat> for November. So tell me, how did you get into the banking business then, Alessandro? It's a very long story. So I'm a civil engineer by training and I was doing road and railway projects in Guinea, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, in Western Africa and in Poland also. And then somebody, somebody told me, you need to understand finance. So I went for an MBA at INSEAD, and that got me into financial services. I joined GE, then I joined PayPal, then I joined Lloyd's, and I had PayPoint, and all the like. So um, it, it was almost, for me, it, was, it felt continu as a continuity, going from civil engineering to finance, because the, the logic of engineering applies to finance also. Um, and I was lucky to gen join the financial services um, this industry at the point of the introduction of the internet. So I was there when the big crash of 1999-2000 uh, happened. And let's see if we have one, one other one coming our way soon too. So. Well, that's going to be an interesting question as to whether or not we've got contagion risk all after all the things that have been happening in the world of crypto. Of course, it's a, a very interesting point you make about civil engineering and engineering. After all, none other than the most dynamic man in the entire exchange world is Jeffrey Sprecher, who himself is a qualified engineer. So not uncommon as a career path to manage to be in finance. How did you find the INSEAD MBA? I found it fantastic. I think what it did, it kind of challenged your the way you think and challenged who you are. So you go in as a um, with a perception of what you, what are you going to do and what the MBA is going to do for you, and it completely up, up, upends that, transforms who you think you are and how you engage, etc. And also, you make amazingly good friends. I'm still in touch with my friends from Insead. I graduated in '93, so many, many, many moons ago, and I still I'm in touch with them on a daily basis. So it's a very tight network. And I'm seeing my wife actually went to Harvard, and they don't have this. So I think Insead is unique. In that perspective. Yes, it's an incredible place, actually, NCAD. I've had the joy of being grilled by the students on a few occasions as a guest lecturer. I'd like to say I went along and gave a guest lecture, but actually it felt more like they actually managed to interview me for a course of an hour and a bit, having given me the chance to make some remarks so that I had a peaceful time for the first half hour. It's, it is a really, really interesting close-knit university, and certainly I think it's one of the gems of European education, certainly the yeah. gem of European business education, given the number of people who've come out of it to great things. So, so you moved over into the finance and banking side. And, and what really started yeah. motivating you towards the idea of banking needing a reinvention and how you would get there? Well, very simply, is as, a, as an engineer, you look about uh, how things operate. And I was thinking about, uh, an engineer always says things about if this, then that. So it's very clear. You don't have ambiguity in engineering. And you suddenly realize that banking was following a lot of rules and processes and uh, op operational choices that were not based on what's possible today, but were based on what was possible 20, 30 years ago. So you suddenly realize that it became very evident to me that the way you you're allocating this loan, the way you're underwriting this individual, the way you're providing 
um, uh, wealth, um, a means of this person protecting their wealth are very old fashioned. The dialogue that you're having with your customers are not reflective of what is possible today. And eventually, if you keep on obstructing transformation and change, somebody will do it to you and you will be excluded. And I think that was what's so exciting about financial services was this where this very clear, visible uh, proof in, my, in front of my eyes that um, we were that the banks were not taking advantage of technology. And it was very, very clear that others were. And these others would eventually eat the cake, eat the bank's cakes. So that's what really attracted me. This this um, imminent danger, but imminent opportunity that uh, digital technology brought about. But that's so fascinating, though. But w- I mean, in the different kinds of organization you were <clears> in, because you were obviously in several different kinds of financial entity. How did you find the message went down when you were preaching the idea that there was going to have to be wholesale change? Um, well, uh, to tell you the truth, what happened, uh, the learn- lesson I learned when I was at G Capital, uh, which was my first job after, after business school, was that you don't call it disruptive. You, can, you don't call it disruption. You just call it as an extra opportunity. So you have to be very, very careful when you speak to an existing bank about the dangers or the opportunities offered by digital transformation. If you tell them that your business model is, is I was going to use a bad word, um, I won't do it. If your business model is 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 in trouble, and you need to transform it, um, that makes a lot of people very very weary, and they think to themselves immediately, um, okay, when will this thing hit the fan? And they say, well, two, three, four, five years, and they're all thinking to themselves, well, I'm not going to be in this job for another five years, so you know what? I'm going to stick to my guns and do whatever I'm doing right now. I'm not going to rock the boat, and they don't, and that's why you go all the way till. It's too late. Uh, the, the point of being, the point of no return with transformation in banks. So the trick that I found, not a trick, but the strategy that I use early on, which is what I also advise my the, the companies that I mentor, is is don't call transformation transformational. Don't call disruption disruptive. Just talk. Don't say this is how the market will be and this is what you have to do. Don't tell them if you follow this this technology, you follow this approach, you'll sell three percent more, and that gets your attention of the attention of the decision makers. That's a fascinating pointer altogether. So don't, therefore, teach people or tell people that they're going to have, tra- have to have transformation. Don't tell them it's about disruption. Simply hit them in the bottom line and might, that might get them going. But you, you raise a very key point, which is the, sort of the incumbency factor. I mean, people do think, well, I've only got five years to go in this job, so therefore I'm not going to rock the boat. And, and it can be very, very difficult to enact change because even then, when they think they're going to get an extra 3% of sales, there still seems to me to be a lack of motivation in a lot of particularly retail focused businesses where they don't seem so fussed about managing to pick up some extra money and just want to keep to the status quo. So I think, I think what happens is that you need to assume that everybody has good intent in mind and that they will do that. What they're looking at is a, is a, is a very diverse set of options and choices they have in front of them. And they'd like to minimize risk for the customer, for the business, for themselves, for their own career, and so on. If you go with something that is sounds more risky than it is, or sounds risky or dangerous, even though they believe that you this is disruption is coming, that transformation is coming, you create a reluctance in the adoption of what you're proposing. So I think what you need to es- explain that this transformation will be profound and will be radical, but you don't need to worry about it. Let's focus upon this little thing that we need to do today, this little step forward we need to take, this first brick and this amazing bridge that we're building to the other side of the divide. Um, And just focus on that. And I think if you're able to create capabilities that the small add-on actually delivers value uh, in its implementation, you have the opportunity of creating change by doing it one step at a time, one brick at a time, one grain of sand at a time you build the dam with. So very tactical, I know, but uh, Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's an approach, yeah. Okay. No, that, that's a very interesting, very <clears throat> sound approach, particularly, I think, when you're dealing with, because it's interesting because everybody's talked, and I mean, good grief, I wrote Capital Market Revolution 20-something years ago and said, oh, banks could be wiped off the face of the earth. And I must say, I had to 
radically revised this when I realized that <laughs> banks were actually staying around and, and they seem to be as powerful as ever. Although you know, my thesis is that essentially probably around about 2008, that was probably the peak of the 500 year cycle of banking, which had begun all the way, all those years ago with the uh, with people on benches in, in Italian marketplaces and so on. Yes, and therefore, yes. it, you know, it's it is a mega, mega channel. And it's very difficult, I think, in banking to really give people um, a lot of motivation to move forward. I mean, I, I compare that with, say, for example, capital markets businesses. I mean, exchanges used to be the sleepiest of sleepy hollows, where mm -hmm. effectively you sent the brother who wasn't competent enough to be a leader of industry or a major in the army and probably couldn't manage to recite enough prayers in order to be a member of the church. So you sent the sort of the dimbo of fourth in line and you put them off into a stock exchange because that was a perfect thing to do because it was just processing all day. But the exchange business did turn around, but that was because it very quickly got a bullet between the eyes um, or at least pointed right between the eyes during the early years of dot com. And suddenly people realized how much they'd have to move forward. There's still a lot of days where I sort of feel the banking industry is kind of muddling through. I don't know. Maybe you disagree with me. Uh, I, I agree that it looks that way, but I don't think it's, it's actually it's not really muddling through, but it's truly trying to keep their feet on the ground as much as possible. They, most banks, I think, um, are trying to be as cautious as they can while at the same time being open and engaging in transformation. That said, do I think that banks as we know them today will exist in the next 10 years? I'm not sure. I am not sure. So, I think it's certainly true that when you look at well, even how banks have moved in the course of the last 10, 15 years, there are incredible areas where they used to make, or at least they used to charge egregious fees compared to what we're used to now. I mean, just the process yeah. of transferring money used to be something that involved uh, quite a few Hail Marys, and then it seemed to disappear into Swift for several days, at which point in time everybody blamed everybody else when it didn't come out the other side. Whereas now we've obviously got a process where you can move so much money for pennies. And actually, to be to be fair, I, I truly shocked the other week when I rang up and found out that even Lloyd's Bank was sending money for next to no charges most places, which really did shock me because that was an establishment original British clearing bank. So perhaps that's the hand of Alessandro there in terms of reinventing banking. I'm going to I'm going to pin that I, one I, on I, you, whether I, you like the credit or not. I did my I made my contribution many a few years ago, but um, I, I think I think what's what's happening is banks, um, in a way, are stuck in a perception of who they are. So banks honestly think that they have a set of products that they provide their customers, and in fact, many banks oftentimes call them so they call the branches as call them stores, and they believe that they have these products that they're selling to their customers, and these customers will find the product that is right for them. And with digital technology, you just distribute them more efficiently and you make them slightly more configurable and so on. The truth is um, no customer wakes up in the morning thinking of a financial product. And you, you just think about what the financial product can allow you to do. Mm -hmm. And that is something that is, um, that is where digital is taking us. With, interestingly, is where banking was in the Middle Ages. When you mentioned the bank on the, the the medieval cities of Italy when that was first constructed. When the dialogue between the banker and the bank and the customer took place, the banker never thought, what product can I sell this individual? They thought, okay, who is this individual? I know almost everything about them because they live in the same community. Um, what are their needs? What do they want to achieve? And the bank would create a product that was exactly based on the customer's needs and expectations. And you know, also be cautious. I'm not saying wants, but needs. So they weren't thinking, okay, customer wants a loan. The customer wants to bring import silk from China. What do they need to do to be able to get that silk over uh, and pay for that silk that's coming over? That was the that was the concept. What happened as banking became industrialized, industrial revolution hit, and so on and so forth, the bank and the customer became more and more distant from each other. So the decision making of the bank moved to headquarters, and at the branch level, there was very little decision that was made. And what happened that that product had to become standardized. So the banker came in and said, so Mr. Customer, what do you want to do? The customer told the story and then they said, oh yes, yes, you need this product, okay? And the product was sold. The product became a very generic proposition that was offered to the client, um, um, not necessarily customized to their needs. And this became quite extreme with what we call, uh, what in the book I call the IT bank, which is the bank 
uh, that uses computers, but at the same time, it is not a digital bank. Okay. What happened with the digital revolution is suddenly the possibility or the potential of hyper-customization of the financial product. And the ability for me to be able to sit in front of the customer uh, and create a product that is designed on their, on, on, on their needs based on an understanding of, their, of the customer's profile and perspective based on technology, which is very much similar to the, uh, to the medieval bank. The only difference is the medieval bank was a one-to-one -one dialogue while the digital bank is a one to a million dialogue. So in yeah. the bank, in the medieval bank, I, the customer and the banker are engaged and the customer was a, was a segment of one, okay? With digital banking, you can be, the bank can speak to a million customer and again can be a segment of one because the technology allows you to segment to create this proposition, which is entirely driven by the customer's needs, again, not wants. And um, that is the potential for technology. Now that goes way directly in the face of banks today. Because banks are not designed with the perception of creating a segment of one for customers. They're thinking about grouping them, uh, controlling risk, controlling uh, pro pro um, uh, profitability, et cetera, et cetera, based on, on, on segments. And that is something that is now built into the DNA of the bankers today. And the banks are designed to operate that way. So um, it's going to be quite interesting to see how digital banking will transform that. And you see that happening in a lot of the digital banks are saying, I want to be customer centric and I want to create a product which is exactly what the customer wants and the customer needs on the basis of my understanding of their needs verified by the customer. Sorry, long, uh, long diatribe. Oh, it's a very, very interesting answer. And there's so much to pick out of it because certainly, as you say, the, the difference between 500 years ago is very, very person-centric and effectively bespoke banking that was according to the customer's product as opposed to the sort of top-down centricity of, of banking as you go along. And I, I love the point you make about, well, people don't wake up in the morning thinking that they really want to interact with their bank. And certainly, I don't think anybody ever woke up in the morning thought I'd really really like to go to my bank branch and mm -hmm. other than if they actually need to process something although at the same time I, I've also got to say I mean the one thing I've noticed since COVID is that all the bank branches that I used to know of have all closed so actually I don't even know where banks are anymore in in the city of London and central London in terms of the bank branches that deal with retail customers I mean they're there somewhere yeah. but they've certainly shrunk enormously and, and I suppose that's I mean very interesting point you make the dif difference between banks that have technology installed and banks that are actually living digital. And that mm -hmm. certainly is a huge, huge step. So how do you manage to make banks get into the, the idea that, I mean, they are, they're the ultimate example of what I call the bold generation, born analog, living digitally. And how do you get them to actually start living digitally as banks when you're trying to reinvent banking? Well, uh, if you think about how banking has changed, or banks adopt innovation through three stages of change, okay? And this is obviously my perception, so you can, you can challenge me in any way you want, but there's three stages of transformation. The stage one is when you adapt your current capabilities to digital technology. So what you sell in store in, in branch, you sell online. Exactly the same way, same data captured, same underwriting and so on. This creates a series of capabilities, skills, cultural attached, cultural behaviors, talent, et cetera, that allows you to evolve your business. And what happens is that the banks go into that stage and they start evolving into something that is slightly different. So uh, yes, that's a good, good chart to have. Um, so uh, what happens there is that these old products and these new propositions that have been developed and new cost take have been developed, they channel into new products. And this culture change and this new talent bring, coming together creates a new business model and you get into the transform stage. Now, all the banks that I know of today, with a very few exception, exceptions, mainly in Asia, at best are in the evolve stage. Okay, Because the transform stage requires the bank to rethink what they're about. So it's no longer selling financial products, but it's selling financial outcomes. So uh, the new bank is something that requires a profound transformation, which requires, for example, no longer being designed around product silos, but being designed around customer silos. So the product becomes a cost center. So the, the lending platform and the investments platform become a cost center and the PNL is driven entirely by the understanding of the segment that you're dealing with. Now, what's interesting about this, this model is, is the fact that 
the new the, what the, it requires is a profound rethink of how the banks are operating. And this is not a technology problem, but it's a legacy problem, and it's a cultural legacy problem. Okay, so I think uh, one thing that could emerge from this gigantic transformation is, in theory, some of the banks could decide that yes, I will adapt this in this new way. But another option will be that the banks will just realize that they are a um, community of users and they will work with third parties to provide the financial product. And the banks will be responsible for retaining that relationship with the customer and relation, re maintaining that um, engagement with the customer and making money, obviously, from the deposits and so on and so forth in that way. So I think we may be seeing new models coming about. The whole banking as a service model that we are talking about could be a way of addressing some of these issues. But um, I am not sure that the ultimate new bank, the business model of how this new bank should look like or will look like, is clear to anyone at this stage. Well, actually, I mean, you raise a very interesting question. The point I would say is, are we going to end up with a monolithic banking model? Because I think one of the things that's happened perhaps in different countries in Europe is we've become used to the idea that there was sort of one core kind of bank and then everybody just replicated it across different brands. But it strikes me that the bank of the future, when it's been reinvented, we actually may end up with a lot of fragmentation and lots of different kinds of banks doing different things. Um. I think that is definitely one of the possibilities. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think we're going to go towards a Web3 web version where the banks will be decomposed and created and separated. Different functionalities will be separated. They will communicate seamlessly with each other. But as far as the delivery of the financial product is concerned, it's not delivered by the monolith, but it's delivered by different components of capability that are offered in the back end. The interface with the customer will be one, okay? But everything else behind it will probably be fragmented. This is an idea that uh, my co-writer in the book, uh, Helene Panzerino, has brought up many times, is that of uh, the community is the one of the biggest elements of a bank. And I think that is something that we need to remember. Uh, a bank is the provision of the service, but it's relevant if you don't have the community on the other side. So community is vitally important to the bank. And actually, this brings us to, therefore, an interesting point. We actually tell us a little bit. How did your book come about? Well, it was it was a discussion that we, both Elena and I were writing always these articles and we we're talking to um, startups and banks and our clients and so on. And we just thought it would be worthwhile to bring everything down, distill all our findings across the different contacts that we had, the different banks, about the different experiences that we had. And to bring it together into a single device, a single book that anybody could read, find interesting and not find it too technically challenging and be able to understand where banking is going to without a kind of diktat of these are this is what you should expect. But saying these are the trends that we are seeing. These are some of the possibilities that could happen. Where do you think it's going to go? It's going to be very much uh, driven by the use that the banks will make by the way regulators will operate, by the way technology will change, and most importantly, by, by the way our appetites as consumers and as, as bank customers will, will adapt. Um, and uh, frankly, um, most of the things that we describe in the book actually are taking place and we're seeing it all around us. So, um, so give, a, give us a couple. <laughs> God, that's fabulous. I mean, I'm, I'm delighted for it all together. It is a very readable book. I really commend you upon Thank it. You. It's, it's most most approachable for, for a topic that could be, let's face it, the world of banking is not unknown for having some pretty dry tomes to, to manage to work your way through when you're studying the, uh, the black art of banking. So give us an idea of a couple of the things that you haven't talked about already that are actually sure. happening at the moment in the banking environment. Yeah, I, I think, I think um, some of the interesting things that I think about is the, the, um, the change between the, the uh, expectation that the customer goes to a bank to buy a product and to get an outcome. And I think what we're seeing is very much the growth of the bank with three products only, or the emergence of a bank that has three products only, which is, I would say, the best prototype of this is the WeChat Bank in, in China and how they operate and how they blur the lines between the financial product engaging and the outcome. So I think a bank, an ideal bank, will have ultimately three products, 
there will be a payment account. So that, you know, as you were mentioning earlier, even Lloyd's now doing that so that I should be able to send money to you, to a, to a customer of mine in, um, in Asia or to invest in a specific platform as easily as possible. And the bank should not tell me what method you want to use. The bank should tell me I'll take care of it. And I should be aware that the bank is going to treat me fairly and use the cheapest way possible, the fastest way possible to get the money away. So the universal payment account will be one element that will bring everything together. Then they will address the two other needs that I have as, a, as, a, as, as, as an entity, a consumer, but also as a business. Every business, every customer of a bank has two other needs, which are one is I don't have enough capital and I need more capital. I need more cash. So a credit line. And the consumer side, the credit line all goes from an overdraft all the way down to mortgage. But it's always the same. The bank trusts the customer and the customer and it gives them a credit line based on whatever metrics that they want to capture to be able to underwrite this customer. But they provide them with a credit line that is affordable and is right for what the customer wants to achieve. At the, at the opposite of this is I have a bit of extra capital and I want to protect it. And on the retail perspective, that goes from a uh, pers- from a, the ability to get a savings account all the way down to be able to make an investment, but also to buy a pension and also to buy insurance. So all of these products that right now banks are living in separate areas are ultimately designed for me to be able to protect the extra that I have and to use this ex- extra cap this extra liquidity to protect my future. What brings these two things together is what in this chart I call intelligent guidance, and that's where the core value of the bank will come. The bank has to become a trusted ally, a trusted friend, where I, the customer, will go to for every need that I have. That monolithic bank that you were describing, in reality, is an intelligent genie that takes takes my hand and takes me through all I need to do. Now, interestingly, this is this diagram applies, for example, in a variety of industries. It applies in the corporate world. It applies in the private banking space. It applies in the capital markets. It's always the same. We have these three needs. Every organization that deals with the bank has these three needs, and they come together in, in this fashion. Banks right now are missing the point, and they're trying to be the master credit provider. They want to become the single element, one little um, um, mosaic tassel of the credit line. They should be thinking about what is the end product? What is the end outcome of what I want to achieve? And they're not doing that. And that is very difficult, as I mentioned, to, to engage with because it requires profound, profound rethinking of where the banks are going to go. This, this model also operates really well if you go in the perspective of the, what everybody's talking about, which is decentralized finance. So the provision of banking. Decentralized finance works when I have a trusted gatekeeper, a Virgil to your Dante, if you want, that holds my hand, that takes me through hell, but at the same time, make sure I don't fall into the pit of, of destruction and despair, okay? And that is what the bank should be. The banks right now are a bit confused. They're a bit schizophrenic on what their, what their proposition is. And I think if you go back to basics, if you go back to, to the principles of what banking work was created for, I think you'll have a much easier time. Sorry for the, again, the long... Uh, so it's, it's very interesting as you're working your way through this, but I'm, I'm, I'm still struggling slightly because you mentioned in one way the fact that you still foresee that banks are going to be very, very considerable department stores, but at the same time, you're trying to talk them out of doing certain lines of business. I mean, is it the case that this will be by, say, geography or by type of bank? Or again, are we looking at the idea that there will be sort of loose alliances of different kinds of banking and fintechs that will come under, say, a big brand umbrella? All of the above. Uh, and it may be that one, maybe the future for some of us is that our bank is not going to be a bank. Maybe our bank is going to be Facebook. Well, maybe not, but if it's if not, or Twitter. Uh, but maybe your bank is going to be a social platform. Maybe WeChat will be my bank and WeChat will make sure that I get the right approach, the right services that I want and I can trust. Uh, or Lloyd's will become my bank, but then through Lloyd's, I can get not only the investment product that Lloyd's provides, but I can get access to the whole of the market. And I can I can use Lloyd's to pay. And when Lloyd's can provide me the payments themselves, they will do it. But if they need to use a a, a crypto exchange to transfer my funds more rapidly, they will do that. And I don't need to worry about it because I know I can trust them. So what's great about this thing, Mm -hmm. yeah. What's great about this this theory is that it sounds fantastic, but it doesn't work without regulation, okay? 
And the big challenge that we have is regulation. Yes, but the, the big challenge that we have is regulation because it's also proportionate re regulation, isn't it? Because you've just mentioned a bank that in certain areas may have fundamental capital risk, that in certain places may be actually holding clients' funds. But in other places, you're mentioning a lot of things that sound to me just like fintech processes where you're not having the same degree of capital risk. And I mean, for example, obviously, simple EMIs and PSPs, payment service providers and electronic mm -hmm. money institutions, you know, they're a great example of something that have remarkably low levels of regulatory capital simply because they can't actually get their hands on the client's money. Um, yeah. Now, it strikes me then you're going to have a whole different capital model as well as regulatory capital Absolutely. model i mean of a bank Absolutely. Absolutely. and i think you get you can envisage a bank that its only job is to hold the capital the only job is to right. make sure that the capital is safe that i don't see why that's not a possibility if you look at the way a retail bank is organized they have all these capabilities of generating income that are built in house and they're much more inefficient than what is done by some of the fintechs uh, and bought in a few years ago came out and said, you know, uh, what Starling is, it's like a bank. The only percent is 30% less. It has 30% less costs than a bank. Okay. Yeah. If Starling is able to provide a current account more cheaply where I deposit money there, why can't I become where the deposit stays but the current account functionality is provided by a third party that does a better job than I can do at a lower cost? And therefore, I can deliver a, a lower cost, better user experience. Doesn't and I that... think... I think... You know, I, I think you hit the nail on the head there for me. Sorry to interrupt, but it's it's a fascinating issue. First of all, I totally agree with you. I've long <clears> thought that there would be, in the end, a kind of clearing bank. I mean, essentially banks that just make money out of being asset custodians, which might yes. be just asset custodians of cash and, and not a great deal else. I think that's absolutely understandable because you can see so many clearing models that work for that. I, I also yes. find it very, very interesting where you talk about these differentiated models like Anne Bowden, because I mean, in Victory or Death, my most recent book, I mean, I mentioned the fact of how fundamentally brilliant banking is in so many ways and and those are actually quite often the trends that they inherited from 500 years ago and kept finessing but at yeah. the same time there are so many areas where they're fundamentally inefficient and i mean in capital markets if you charge people a few basis points good grief all of the investment banks come down on you like the hounds of hell and say you're the worst people in the world and you're stealing food from investors mouths whereas you know, banks sort of, well, until very recently, pretty much everything a bank thought they were doing was about a thousand basis points between the bid and the offer. I mean, certainly yeah. the case when you deposited your money in one day and then owed money on your credit card three weeks later, it was uh, absolutely egregious spaces. And not because of inefficiency, just because of that was actually how the cost base was built into the, the overall banking model. Yeah, you can call it that there wasn't intentional, but maybe it was. Maybe it was intentional yeah. that. I, I have a same user account and I'm still paying you for my credit card. You know, yes, so. well, it, it's also that sort of whole, it's that whole breadth of these sorts of bid offer spreads that all seem to be a hundreds, if not a thousand basis points, which were quite sensational compared to where everybody else is in the marketplace. I mean, I, I mean, I think it's interesting. You look today at a lot of people who are in merchanting and they sort of go, oh, something like PayPal. I'm not trying to be unfair to your former employer, but something like PayPal looks quite expensive compared to the credit card solutions we're getting today. And you start thinking, my goodness, I mean, the, the frictional cost of doing these transactions has gone through the floor in the course of the last 20 years. And, and it will go even further. And I think what happens is that, again, we talked about briefly on, on Web3 and de decentralized finance. Mm -hmm. What is coherent and important in the uh, decentralized finance is trust that my third party is going to be able to deliver this to me. And unless all of these providers are regulated or this will not happen, one way that this could happen is that to have a trusted gateway which is, again, against uh, all principles of decentralized finance, but maybe the banks can become these trusted gateways. Okay? And so they... they, they yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. go ahead. Go on. No, no, I was going to say, I see, I, I, I'm, in, I'm in a fascinated position at the moment because, actually, when I hear decentralized finance, despite having written Capital Market Revolution 20-something years ago and talked about electronic money would take over everything. And here I am, I've now been in the UK for a week and I haven't actually touched a banknote or a coin yet. So therefore, something's happening electronically, if, even if it's not a digital asset per se or a central bank digital currency or something. But what really intrigues me about this whole 
impact issue when we when we look at digital money. It's, or how can I put it? it it's the whole concept of, yes, decentralized finance to me makes no sense because if the government doesn't know where the gov- the money is, then the central bank's not very comfortable. So therefore, I think we're in heated agreement. I think you do have to have these trusted intermediaries. And I realize now that a, a thousand Bitcoin maximalists will fall upon us like the hounds of hell because that's absolutely completely and utterly egregious. And I sound like the Don Cupid of sort of digital assets. No, look, um... Look at the concept of of cryptocurrency and how it operates. Okay, look at how it enables the transfer of wealth from one point of the globe to the other point of the globe at close to zero cost. Notwithstanding the environmental impact that can be addressed in in better ways of creating the managing the DLTs, Um, it is a better solution than what we have right now. Is that going to be the end play? Most likely, yes. Is it going to look like we know we see them today? Probably no. So is Bitcoin a reasonable uh, payment tool? Probably not. Is it an interesting investment device, investment advice, asset? Probably. I mean, it's, it's like gold. What's the real value of gold? It's a malleable metal that that is doesn't hold its shape and it's it doesn't doesn't go doesn't doesn't oxidize. But is that good enough to be paying so much for a little bit of a, me- of a yellow metal? The same applies to to Bitcoin. Bitcoin has value because people want to give it value, and it's a means of transferring wealth from A to B. That's all there is. It's not efficient. No, I, I, it is not efficient. I agree with you. And I, I mean, I think the two points I would make there is obviously what we always think about Bitcoin. And I've been saying this for many years is in one way, Bitcoin was the Copernican revolution in finance because it turned round our whole idea that the bank had to be the absolute be all and end all epicenter of every financial transaction. So in that, it did an incredible thing. And it's the Model T Ford of cryptocurrency because it got everybody using it. But I mean, as I've always done, I've lectured all over the world for for umpteen years. And if you go to everybody and say, well, you can have the keys to whatever, an Alfa Romeo or a BMW or a Toyota Yaris or this Ford Model T, absolutely nobody wants to drive the Ford Model T home because it's hard work and it's unreliable and it probably doesn't have a roof on it. And yet 90% of the DNA of that car is effectively today's Alfa Romeo, BMW, Ford, whatever. And I I think that's where we are, isn't it, with with Bitcoin? I mean, I, I don't really buy the Bitcoin maximalist view that it's going to be the once and forever thing. I think it becomes a hobby interest like the Ford Model T in future. The question is, I think it's then we're just haggling about the price. Some people think it's a Ferrari GTO, and I think it's a Ford Model T. Just think about the first cars that were mm-hmm. introduced to Paris and London or in New York, right? So this, yep. this thing was a mechanical device. It looked like a carriage. It made lots of noise. It was made of metal. It had no heating. And you were going to customers around the world, and you said, you know that carriage of yours that you can sit in that's nice and warm? It's got somebody driving it. You can sit around. You can have a little meal while you're having a drive and so on and so forth. I'm going to replace it with this device. It's a mechanical device. It's made of metal. You have to drive it yourself. It has no heating. Uh, and you have to run it. And other cars can come and hit you. And you could hit other cars. And by the way, it's full of an inflammable liquid. You know, Anybody would say, I'm not touching it. But now, <laughs> there's no carriages anymore, anywhere. right? Why? Because one, the quality of the service of the car, the KO, these yeah. are the cars you said, yeah, for a male improve. But more importantly, we put street signs. And we put yes. and we put the ability that you stop at a red light, uh, yeah. even if you're in Naples, that would change it sometimes. But um, you, then you stop at a red light and a green light, and all the principles of you you, you cannot park here, and um, who's responsible if somebody gets run over. All these things enabled the adoption of the car by the mass. Right now, there's it's a it's a wild west with with uh, cryptocurrencies and, um, yeah. and the technology there. Un- unless there's regulation, they will not be mass adopted. When the regulation is there, they will be mass adopted and they will become the alternative to SWIFT and all the payment solutions that we have right now. Most banks realize this. Also, most banks realize that if they slow down the adoption of that technology, they have a few more years of rent that they can generate from systems that are obsolete. Okay. And uh, interestingly, the in my mind, the, the country that is doing, the, the part of the world that is doing the best in this is the European Union. Because the European Union is, yes, skeptical about the digital currency and so on and so forth, but they are engaging with it. If you look at the Americans, if you look at the Chinese, the Chinese are seeing this as ways of controlling their people. The Americans would like to do it, but then you have the big banks are saying, whoa, if you build this, then I won't be able to, to charge the way I do for the products that I provide. And uh, let's slow it down a bit. 
Okay, so the Europeans, I think, are going to push for it. And we will slowly start getting some standards established. And once the standards are in place, it's going to be the emperor has no clothes, very clearly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a very fair. And, and actually, the other area I would, though fundamentally, I would even take it a step backward and praise the European Union, something that will have many of my viewers probably falling over at this point in time. But when we're talking I about... I can't believe we're doing this. I can't believe we're doing you know, this. But, I, but, it, but it's true because ago, when European you're... The European Union was, uh, was terrible. Now suddenly it's become innovative. So. Well, what they've done, well, what they've done incredibly well, Alessandro, and I agree with you heatedly, I mean, actually, payments... I mean, one of the things they did do, the euro currency is whatever the euro currency is, but ultimately bringing in things like tips and all of those sorts of approaches so that therefore I can I can sit I can actually sit here in London and use a European bank to send money across the European Union in near real time. That has been a phenomenal innovation because it's the only it's the only place I can think of in the world where you can actually cross what is still a political border and, and manage to move your money around essentially free, if not entirely free, in near real time, where just a few years ago that was costing you actually a, a swinging percentage. And let's face it, wh why, why are we also seeing lots of Bitcoin and blockchain ad adoption in the emerging world? Because who wants to get ripped off when you're trying to send your pounds to the Philippines or to Africa, where you used to be a civil engineer, for example? Yes, but think about sending money from one side of the states to the other side of the states, from New York to LA. Yeah, is it is it, is it efficient? Is it fast? Or Not why especially. is it that, that you walk around big cities in the US and there's people accepting pieces of paper with signatures on them for payments? Those are really weird. Those what is the things, reason, aren't they? Yeah, they're, they're quite. They're yeah, like a. They're, they're like a kind of inverse NFT. You write your own amount yeah. on them rather than waiting for the market to decide how much your pixels are worth. Yes. Curious. Yeah. Don't and, know if catch on. All this technology, <laughs> they have caught us, sadly. Uh, so the, all this technology was invented, interestingly, in the States, right? But they're not adopting mm -hmm. it. Why is that? And my challenge is that it's the regulators. The regulators are not thinking about what the market needs. The regulators are thinking, what are the lobbying groups of the banks? I said, my God, I'm not, I can't believe I'm saying this out in a public environment. But okay. Yeah. Um, so the American regulators could be could be a bit more proactive in thinking about customer outcomes rather than thinking welfare of the infrastructure that they're on. So when well, the Brits, I, I, came, when the Europeans, mm -hmm. sorry, when the Europeans came out with the faster payment requirements, with uh, with GDPR, with PSD two, do you remember how we all complained that the banks are not really? It's terrible for banking, terrible for everybody. In reality, it became we create a whole series of products that are actually really good for consumers. I must admit, I never complained about any of it because I wasn't working in a bank. I was just a poor entrepreneurial individual with a few accounts. And I thought, this has got to be better. It, it was, I mean, banking had become so bad by that stage. And I think, yeah. to be fair, the banking industry has responded across they the have. board in Europe. Very well. They really if have. You, if you go look at most European banks have an open banking API that you can tap into. What does that yep. mean? It means that the banking data can be shared with other entities, other banks and so on. So there's much more transparency, which means that the pricing is more reasonable. So if I'm a consumer and I have access to this, things, I can compare how much the same product will cost for cost me in other providers. And therefore, it becomes a much more transparent market. No, without without that, I think the banking world will be less efficient. And I think I have to respect that. GDPR on the other side is another interesting thing. It's not necessarily connected to banking. But the way mm -hmm. our data is monetized is regulated in Europe much better than it is anywhere else in the world. And I think that is that is a very important aspect of financial services because one thing that I realized with digital technology is that data and money are not that different from each other. No, no. They're they're essentially so closely related as to be as to be absolutely vitally important. And uh exactly. Yes, it's, it's an intriguing position when we look at reinventing banking all the way through the chain and how that has changed already for people. But yet it's been, I would say almost so far, it seems to be semi painless because people still have effectively most of the same tools. OK, in, in many countries, they've lost their checkbooks. Thank goodness, but not in the United States of America or digital Malta to, to take a couple of benighted examples of countries that are still not really moving on. 
but it is it is quite fascinating when you're talking about the whole dynamics of change here because the banking industry has been moving remarkably well. I wouldn't say quickly. And certainly the American regulators haven't moved at all, except that I see hallelujah, the, the office of the controller of the currency in the USA have finally decided next year to open a technology department to look towards the future of banking. Barely, what, three decades after the World Wide Web started to gain wholesale popularity. Um, it's quite, quite fascinating. So when you're bringing that all together, is, is there anything in particular in your model that it's key for people to understand in terms of the future of banking and reinventing banking, Alessandro? I think it depends who you are. If you're a consumer, I think what you need to think about as ba of banking is as a service that is provided to you, and you need to be able mm -hmm. to use the player that gives you the lower cost and highest quality of service. And by quality of service, I include security. In that so that has to be a fundamental need that you want to have if i think about a, a bank i need to think about am i in touch with my customers needs not necessarily expectations because the expectation of the carriage driver around the third century was not to drive with a car but when the car came the car replaced the carriage in a heartbeat the same will potentially happen with financial services um if if a better product comes about that is delivered different than what the bank does the banks will have a really hard time retaining the customer so the banks need to start thinking about what am I about and what is the value of the, my proposition? I provided that model that I showed you with the three entities. Maybe there's others that describe that better than that. But that is, that is the one thing that the banks need to do. Third, I think, is the role of the regulators. And the regulators need to realize that they are playing a fundamental role in a transformation of an industry. Similar to that of the road safety for the car, um, that regulation is is fundamental, and it has to be done in a way that is not doesn't strangle innovation, but at the same time doesn't create a free for all. And all these four th three things come together with the last thing, the last element, which is technology. And technology is, is evolving in every possible direction. We're becoming much more sophisticated. The connectivity is becoming much more pervasive. Intelligence of this. Uh, of, of these tech this technology is becoming much more um, important and visible. Therefore, we need to also be conscious of the technological transformation altogether. So the customer, the provider, the regulator, and the technology together are changing banking. And I think we need to keep an eye on all four, and we need to be very conscious of what's happening in all four environments. I think that's a very apt point. And certainly when you look at regulation, to go back to our, our car analogy we've been discussing throughout today, the one thing we don't want is regulators to be so prescriptive that they believe a man must stand in front of the car walking along with a red flag so that it can't yes. do more than five miles an hour or 12 miles an hour. But at the same time, we obviously don't want to have an absolutely crazed free for all because, well, we've already got that. We call it cryptocurrency. And uh, that doesn't really seem to be working out terribly well, not because of the design of cryptocurrency, but because- For now, for, for now. For now, for now, be an optimist. For now, for now. No, no, for now. Well, I mean, my, my, view, my view is very much we're, we're at that Model T Ford stage, and therefore we've got, we're in version 1.0. Somewhere on the horizon, crypto winter will finally lift, and a lot of people probably will return to their basements in the near future and work on creating crypto V2.0, which is going to be the killer app, like Web 2.0. And that might take months. It might take a couple of years to really start to emerge. But then we're going to have a seriously working proposition because certainly when you compare, I think, to be fair, what banks have done very well, which is make most online banking relatively commonsensical with a reasonable graphical user interface. And you yeah. compare that to trying to buy even a simple NFT on some of these platforms where it feels like if you're old enough to remember one of those sort of Japanese racing car models that you made maybe as a child or aircraft models where the instructions were in Japanese and also Japanese translated into English by someone who'd obviously had a, I think, an interim Berlitz course in, say, sort of, I don't yeah. know, Tagalog. And therefore, they didn't really understand what they were saying and you couldn't follow what was going on. And, and I think banks have done very well, whereas the crypto world has not done that. But as soon as that brings us, I mean, we're, we're getting, accelerating our way through this conversation. It's been so lively discussing reinventing banking with you alessandro thank you very much for your time it's a pleasure. 
As you know, I wrote a book, uh, good grief, well, nearly 25 years ago now, called Capital Market Revolution, which uh, was an early bestseller in the fintech genre, to which your own excellent tome has now been added as a bestseller in that genre. Tell me, where, where do you think the capital market revolution goes next, Alessandro? I think what will happen is the capital markets have been more digital than retail banking because of the nature of the business themselves. But at the same time, we're seeing some profound transformations in, in that sector. And what happens to the existing players, I think they need to realize that maybe the answer to um, adapting to the new market does not lie with themselves. And they need to start looking around and saying, OK, who do I work with? Who do I engage with? Who do I partner with? Who do I acquire to enable me to have those skills that I need to be able to be relevant in the, in the future? And uh, that is, I think, a fundamental skill. So I think the realization that I can't do everything in-house anymore. So 10, 20 years ago, a new proposition came. I just hired a few IT guys. I went to uh, some of the big firms and I hired them in. They came in, they designed the solution for me. And that became my way of addressing that requirement. Today, the market is moving too fast. So I think companies need to be able to identify who they should be working with to be able to build that new capability and create an operating model that allows them to, to pick and choose the, 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 the specialty provider that they need and also be able to switch them out if they require a different skill set. So the ability of becoming a, I'm not saying, I don't want to use the term platform because it's very overused, but the ability mm -hmm. of a bank to say, okay, my normal one requirements, a bank, a trading environment, a capital markets group, and so on, is to engage with my end customer. And I need to provide a service to them that is as good as possible considering what the, what, what the environment or the market allows me to do, realizing that's their objective, delivering that service does not mean I have to make it myself. Okay, And finding a way to find that capability elsewhere should be a USP, a unique selling proposition of every bank should be. What makes every organization distinctive is to know where they live in the ecosystem and who they can help them to deliver the next thing. So that's, that's what I say. I think we'll see a lot more partnering. I think that's a very, very apt point. And certainly banks understanding that they shouldn't be building everything themselves. And there are lots of things that they can take off the shelf, because certainly that's something that, to go back to our automobile metaphor, the car companies learned many years ago, which is that let someone else build the brakes and the brake calipers yeah. and all sorts of bits of suspension, but we'll assemble the whole thing and therefore construct an incredibly interesting automobile. We have been, ladies and gentlemen, spending the past hour reinventing banking with Alessandro Hatami, who's also the author of the book of the same name. I thoroughly recommend that you go out and get yourself a copy. It's published by Kogan Page. Our thanks to them for organizing today's speaker. Reinventing Banking and Finance, very, very interesting readable tome. It's been fabulous to be here with a man who's had so much interesting experience across the range of digital transformation in finance companies and banks. Alessandro, we look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you very much for being our guest. Our next show, we've got another great capital market revolutionary, my old friend Brendan Bradley, once the full-on head of innovation at the Deutsche Börse Group. Evolving markets, evolving careers, that's coming up next Tuesday. Tuesday with Brendan. Looking forward to that very much indeed. Let me just say very strong word of thanks tonight to the Seamless Production crew. Thank you, Janella, Marianne and Natalie for a great show all together. My name is Patrick L. Young. Thanks for joining me on this IPO vid 84, Reinventing Banking and Finance with Alessandro Hatami. I wish you all, ladies and gentlemen, a great week in blockchain, life and markets.